Uh, let me now uh, introduce uh, uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Professor Robert Fishman, uh, who's a professor of law and the Harry T. Ice faculty fellow, as well as being a professor of public and environmental affairs at uh, Indiana University uh, and at the uh, Indiana University Maurer School of Law. Uh, Rob will uh, continue to set uh, the stage uh, for the symposium addressing the topic of uh, understanding the legal and policy framework surrounding uh, our national parks. Thanks for coming out, Rob. Let me just begin by adding my thanks to Kayla and the organizers of this conference. I have uh, followed from afar each of the uh, prior 18 Stegner uh, symposia and always have found them uh, interesting to uh, view online or to read the articles that came from them. So uh, when Bob Kider called to invite me uh, to participate in one, particularly one on the national parks, I said what any sane person would say when invited by Bob Kider, which is, yes, the first words out of my mouth. And I also want to say that, um, uh, that Bob paid tribute to Joe Sachs, who is also a very important mentor of mine. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the relevance of Joe's scholarship on national park law and policy. I will say that one thing that stands out about uh, Sachs's legacy as a law professor is that he straddled two worlds that um, is very unusual. Generally, law professors are known principally for being uh, scholars or principally for being uh, people who are actively involved in law in action, law reform, being involved in agencies. There are very few professors who do both. And I will say in tribute to Bob Kiter that he is someone whose scholarship is tremendously respected within the academy, yet is also someone who is constantly involved in issues of um, public policy. And that's not just with his work in the national parks. So uh, it's particularly fitting that I think we're gathered here under the auspices of the Stegner Center under the leadership of Bob and talking about parks, but also to be able to pay tribute to Joe Sachs as well. The, uh, the PowerPoint slide on the national parks that doesn't have beautiful pictures must reflect uh, a particular lack of imagination upon uh, <laughs> on, the, on the part of the presenter. Uh, but I'm going to talk with you today uh, uh, about words, uh, about law and policy. And I'm principally concerned with the words on the page in the next half hour. And I'm going to use that as a way to set the foundation for others to present particular case examples. Law and policy framework, it's very difficult to separate out policy from law. Uh, and I will not uh, try to make a clean distinction between the two. I will, however, begin by talking about the purest of the law sources. I'll first talk about constitutional law. I'll then spend most of my time discussing the statutes that channel the conservation discretion of the National Park Service. And then um, when talking about judicial decisions, I will attempt to combine some of the uh, policy disputes that um, are aired through the judiciary. Uh, first, I think it's important to uh, get a sense of the constitutional underpinnings for management of the national parks. And I want to talk just briefly about three clauses that reflect two important tensions in national park management. The first tension is the one between the legislative and the executive branch. The Constitution gives to Congress the power to make all needful rules respecting property. Appropriately, that's called the property clause. And it's a power that um, Congress holds dear. And uh, one way in which the national parks illustrate uh, Congress's um, 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 uh, territorial assertion of its uh, property cause power is the mere fact that um, there is no national park until Congress says it's so. Unlike many other units in our federal public land system, only Congress uh, 
can make a national park. The only other system like that is the National Wilderness Preservation System. In contrast, the president um, is vested with executive power, this power to carry out the laws, and um, the proprietary day-to-day -day functions of the federal government in managing its lands is a kind of classic executive power, and presidents have not been shy about exerting their influence on park policy, in part by their appointees in the Interior Department and the directorship of the National Park Service, and the presidential power is partly through delegation from legislation to the Park Service, but it is also partly an inherent presidential power. And if we were to get Mark talking more about the history of the national parks, I think um, he'd, be, he'd, he'd probably um, be able to tell some great stories about the roles that presidents, such as the two Roosevelts, have played in using not just their bully pulpit, but in using their powers to shape what their agencies do um, to um, transform particular national parks and the national park systems. But when you read about disputes, and you know this is a great time to be thinking about the tension between Congress, which as Bob just mentioned, the House of Representatives passed a statute seeking to limit presidential discretion to make national monuments. This tension between Congress and the president has important constitutional underpinnings. There's another tension that's easily observed through national park controversies, and that's the federalism tension, the tension between the federal government and the state government. Now, the Constitution uh, deals a very powerful hand to the federal government with the supremacy clause. The laws of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. Now, that does not mean that in national parks or on other federal lands, that there is a kind of iron curtain that comes down around the boundaries of those units that keeps out operation of state laws. And indeed, state laws tend to apply on federal lands except where they conflict with federal laws. And those points of conflict are important friction in federal public land management and national parks in particular. So if you think about particularly the area of wildlife management, which is an area where states have traditionally exerted a dominant control, um, mostly through acquiescence of the federal government, um, the National Park Service, where it ena enacts a regulation, say, limiting fishing in a particular national park uh, in a way that's um, more strict than the state fishing laws would allow. The Supremacy Clause means that in those park areas, that national park rule governs. It reigns supreme. Sometimes, the tension between federal law and state background principles is not so explicitly or expressly uh, clear from a regulation or from a statute, and that's led to some very interesting litigation. Um, but what I want you to understand, just for the purposes of this talk and setting the foundation, is that the Constitution and its allocation of power between the branches and in its distribution of power between the federal government and state government establishes a framework for the law to resolve disputes. And when I talk about the law, I'm really thinking about the means by which we as a society use peaceful methods to resolve conflicts. Now, as between the Constitution and statutes, or between statutes and judicial decisions, I think statutes are the a more important form of law for understanding how the national parks are managed. And I want to uh, talk about four different types of legislation. Legislation that's specifically directed to the national parks. This is what you might call the core law of national parks, which paradoxically proves to be, I think, less important than other sorts of statutes. 
There's overlay legislation that deals with um, uh, federal zoning of lands uh, that uh, are relevant to more than just the national park. So for instance, I mentioned wilderness areas. Congress has designated wilderness areas in national parks, but also in national forests, whichever agencies typically had been managing lands before wilderness designation. Those agencies continue to manage those lands after wilderness designation. The wilderness designation pre, uh, presents a kind of legal overlay on management. I'll then talk a little bit about environmental law. These, I think, have been the most important statutes in uh, constraining the discretion of the Park Service. And then I'll briefly uh, say something about statutes governing procedures, and particular administrative and judicial procedures. First, national park legislation. Really, there are two types. There's organic legislation, and there's establishment legislation. And the presence of those two types of legislation um, uh, define uh, two poles. The one pole, organic legislation, refers to the idea that the national parks are not a mere hodgepodge or collection of units. They're not just the land equivalent of displays in a museum. Instead, they're part of a system. And just like we organisms are more than just a collection of organs, organisms are units where the, uh, our organisms are entities where the individual organs act in an orchestrated manner, right? So that the uh, human being is more than the sum of its parts, more than the sum of the kidneys and the liver and the like. So too is the idea of organic legislation to create a system that can accomplish more than just the sum of managing a bunch of individual units. Now there is a tension between that centralizing tendency of organic legislation, the centripetal pull toward a policy center that contrasts with establishment legislation. Establishment legislation just refers to those statutes that um, set aside a particular piece of land as a national park. And uh, establishment statutes are sometimes quite general, but increasingly in the past few decades, are more and more specific about what Congress has in mind for the Park Service to do on a particular plot of land. In contrast to the centrifugal tendency to pull toward the center of organic legislation, the effect of the hundreds of establishment legislation is to cause a, a system like the park system to kind of spin toward its periphery. There's that centrifugal pull outward from the center uh, toward uh, more site-specific, toward more uh, local interests. And so um, the legislation that deals with the Park Service is in part legislation, this is often not expressed, but what, what you, what, what's useful to understand is that the legislation is about negotiating these conflicting centripetal and centrifugal forces in national park management. Now you've all probably encountered this uh, famous sentence from the 1916 Organic Act. Um, that the purpose of the park system is to conserve scenery and national and historic objects for the enjoyment um, and, uh, and uh, for the concert, for, to conserve and to provide for enjoyment in such a manner as will leave those objects and scenery unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. The meaning of what unimpaired <laughs> uh, calls upon the national parks to do is uh, something that is a theme throughout this talk and has been, I'd say, a central struggle both in the policy making for national parks in subsequent legislation as well as in court decisions. In addition to the oft noted tension between conserving and providing for enjoyment that's embodied in this original mandate, this original mission for the system, I'll also point out that from the beginning of there being a system, Congress understood 
protection not just of nature and scenery, but also historic objects. And the, um, the importance of the national park system for preserving history uh, was written right into its first mandate in 1916. The 1970s were a fairly active time for Congress to revisit organic legislation, not just for the national parks, but for all of the public land system. In 1970, uh, Congress amended the Organic Act to uh, say that the units are united through their interrelated purposes and resources into one national park system as a cumulative expression of a single national heritage. Um, uh, in a way, this is Congress uh, 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 trying to declare a legislative fact where an on-the-ground fact didn't exist. By 1970, the Park Service was struggling with a tremendous diversity of different types of units, from historic sites to Crown Jewel National Parks to uh, a raft of new designations that had been made or were coming, such as national reserves, national lake shores, and the like. Uh, and so Congress sought to clarify the aspiration that whatever it dealt the Park Service, the Park Service's job was to pull this all together as a representation of national heritage, that national heritage is, is is partly nature protection, it's partly historic protection. And the 1978 Congress introduced this notion of integrity of the national park system uh, as a way of clarifying what it meant by um, ensuring that parks were unimpaired, that resources were unimpaired. And I'll show you when we get to policy how the integrity language gets picked up. The 1978 amendments also require the National Park to begin unit level planning. This is the origin of the general management plans in the U.S. Code. And um, the only subsequent important statute is that 1998 statute that Mark mentioned, uh, which was very much a spur for the national parks to get more involved in scientific research, also dealt with concessions reform, which is a, a, a topic that I will not talk about further. It's, it's, it's a very technical uh, subject, uh, something we might get into later. But I really want to focus on how the law has dealt with this central problem of what um, the uh, organic impairment me mandate means. And in particular, in the context of all this establishment legislation, so these are the statutes that tend to pull the system away from a center, uh, away from a common vision toward the per particular visions of each individual unit. Uh, and as you know, there's a hodgepodge of categories and unique designations under the umbrella of the national park system. The first of the establishment statutes was the uh, landmark 1872 law designating Yellowstone as the world's first national park. And you can see that um, the word enjoyment was there from the very beginning. Uh, that's, that's the word that has vexed the Park Service, uh, particularly since 1916, when Congress said, yes, provide for enjoyment, but in a manner that leaves resources unimpaired. Um, Everglades National Park legislation in 1934 represented an important shift for individual units. It spoke of um, an objective for protecting wilderness. And this is some 30 years before the Wilderness Act made wilderness into law. And also uh, provided um, a purpose of preservation of flora and fauna. This reflects a kind of turn in nature, nature protection from a focus on the monumental scenery of the Yellowstones and the Yosemites and the Grand Canyons to um, a concern with what we today call uh, biological diversity, perhaps a more subtle species of nature protection. The modern era finds establishment legislation mandating studies and plans, often studies and plans for very specific um, visitor centers and roads or muse museums that are very much reasons why local members of Congress promote a particular park. Uh, increasingly, um, establishment statutes require the Park Service to consult with particular entities, again, including uh, local governmental units. 
There are um, a proliferation of various advisory councils that are now partnering with the parks by statute. Um, and Congress, um, as it had in especially the 1980s with pollution control statutes, uh, began to require the national parks to report back to Congress on these studies and provided deadlines that the national parks had to meet, uh, requiring the Park Service to pay more attention to these establishment mandates. Now, in addition to legislation dealing specifically with the national parks, there are also statutes that deal with these overlay systems. I'm gonna talk about the three most important ones very briefly, national monuments, wilderness areas, and wild and scenic rivers. First, national monuments. Now, keep in mind, the national monuments are uh, designated by the president in accordance with a 1906 statute, the Antiquities Act. That's the statute that Senator Bennett, I'm sorry, that, um, that's, that's the statute that the House of Representatives just voted to amend uh, in order to provide an environmental review process before the president can, uh, with the stroke of his pen, designate a national monument. Designation of national monument does not designate a national park. However, history has shown that many national monument designations do subsequently then get um, endorsed by Congress uh, as national park units. Uh, a good example of that is Devil's Tower, which was the first monument designated by Theodore Roosevelt shortly after signing the Antiquities Act. These are objects of scientific or historic interest, so the national monument system is very much um, in tune with um, the national park objectives as both nature protection and historic protection. Uh, and there are very few uh, management prescriptions. The statute on its face limits national monuments to the smallest area compatible with proper care and management. But um, uh, the, uh, since the 1970s at least, and probably going back as far as the 1930s, uh, smallest area compatible uh, can encompass many millions of acres of scenery, of landscape. Wilderness areas, the 1964 Wilderness Act uh, establishes quite a bit of statutory management or restriction, prohibits commercial enterprises and permanent roads, and also makes it very difficult for agencies to uh, build structures allow for mechanical transport or motorized equipment in wilderness areas. So uh, where wilderness areas are designated in national parks, this overlay of the wilderness restrictions uh, provides a, an additional set of statutory requirements and a much more specific set of, uh, of, of, of management restrictions on the National Park Service. Uh, and this gets us into the kind of restrictions where uh, plaintiffs who are upset with what the Park Service has done provides them with some traction for judicial review. Um, and then finally, I'll mention that uh, the national parks uh, have, uh, have management authority over quite a few wild and scenic rivers, the vast majority of which are designated by Congress under a 1968 statute. And for those of you who follow issues in Yosemite National Park, you'll know that the requirements of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act have uh, tied the Park Service up in knots where uh, there are historic and long-standing uses of that uh, of the river corridor in Yosemite Valley that are very much in tension in, in tension with the objectives of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. Environmental law, uh, in particular, NEPA and the Endangered Species Act have probably been the most important statutes in terms of uh, twisting the arm of the Park Service in circumstances where it. Um, it is uh, seeking to engage in certain management tasks that are uh, upsetting to uh, uh, certain constituencies. National Environmental Policy Act very famously requires environmental impact analysis, uh, and though it is merely, although only its procedures are 
enforced by the courts. Uh, those procedures which require agencies to engage in a far-reaching analysis of indirect effects and cumulative impact analyses and uh, addressing mitigation have been a very powerful litigation tool. Um, the Endangered Species Act combines its own procedural requirements with substantive standards that uh, prevent the Park Service as well as any other federal agency from engaging in any action authorized, funded, or carried out that might jeopardize the continued existence of the species. This is the statute that's often called the pit bull of environmental law. Maybe we should call it the grizzly bear or the gray wolf of environmental law. It's the, it's the apex predator. A National Historic Preservation Act is uh, very similar to NEPA in its focus on procedure, uh, uh, though substantively it's more concerned with uh, per, uh, protecting the integrity of, 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 of historic resources that qualify for inclusion on uh, a list of, of called the register, the register, uh, the, uh, I, I think the, the best uh, named position in the Interior Department is the keeper of the register. That's a position within the National Park Service, actually, which has its own responsibility to keep the register of national historic places. And then there are the pollution control statutes, where Park Service is both a regulated entity for, say, its uh, wastewater discharges, but it's also a beneficiary, particularly under the Clean Air Act, where national parks are uh, considered areas where uh, particularly visibility and other air resources are protected to the, to the highest possible standards. And then I'll just conclude by saying that as lawyers, uh, we're, um, we're particularly obsessed with procedure. And uh, uh, for uh, anybody who's involved in litigation, particularly seeking to enjoin an agency to do something or to stop an agency from doing something, you know you've encountered the Administrative Procedure Act, which waives sovereign immunity for certain kinds of suits uh, to provide for those sorts of injunctions. And the Administrative Procedure Act is very much the workhorse of taking policy disputes and running them through the courts. Well, my time is up for giving you the basic overlay. Uh, I think that uh, as you hear about uh, the site-specific and particular issues that the other speakers are dealing with, I, I, it might be useful to think through how Congress's mandate to the agencies, how presidential direction through these laws helps to shape and channel those controversies into particular forums for, for uh, uh, dispute resolution, as well as setting certain standards of behavior. If I have time, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just point. Yes, sir. Sorry to be so rude to point. Could you give us, you give us a couple examples of, uh, of uh, park-specific uh, establishment law, I guess you called it? Uh, yes, I think um, a good example is uh, a, part, a national park that's just south of here, Canyonlands National Park. Uh, and some of you may have been familiar with the dispute in Canyonlands over the... Uh, uh, Park Service's management of uh, Salt Creek Canyon. Uh, for some time, uh, the uh, bottom of Salt Creek Canyon was used as a road for uh, recreation and also for access to, was it Angel Arch? Uh, and uh, the national, uh, uh, some environmental groups uh, sued the National uh, Park Service uh, for its uh, allowing that use of the canyon bottom. And resolution of that suit was based both on the Organic Act's mandate to avoid impair, to conserve and provide for enjoyment while avoiding impairment, but also based on the establishment mandate for Canyonlands, which talks of preservation of certain outstanding resources, but does not include recreation in and of itself as an independent objective. And that is an example where I think the lack of or the absence of a specific establishment mandate played a role in influencing two courts to find 
that the, that the Park Service had violated its, its impairment standard under the Organic Act uh, uh, and, and, and also violated the uh, enabling uh, statute uh, because it was, it was um, undermining some of the conservation values without uh, the rationale fulfilling a particular establishment purpose. So there's an example where a court uh, was looking for something perhaps in an establishment or enabling act to counterbalance the organic mandate and in the absence of that uh, tilted a little bit more toward a conservationist or preservationist approach. Oh yes, uh, up the balcony. <laughs> At the risk of being considered <clears throat> a spring butt, um, could you explain to me what about monument designation should require environmental review? Since I understand that monument designation is just perhaps designation, nothing's dug up, nothing's built, uh, it's designated as opposed to, to uh, economic development of a piece of uh, government land which might uh, include uh, digging out the land and exploiting the resources and so forth. C could you explain what the difference is between the two, please? Right, well, I will say that uh, basically the reason why today no environmental review is required for designating a national monument monument doesn't have to do really with the environmental impact. It has to do with the fact that national monuments are designated by the president and not by one of his agencies. NEPA would require environmental review for any kind of administrative designation, even a protective designation, if it's done by an agency like the Interior Department. NEPA review is triggered more or less by proposed federal actions that have uh, a major, uh, uh, major federal actions significantly affecting the quality of the human environment. Significantly affecting the quality of the human environment includes significantly improving the quality of the human environment. And we don't hear very much about those kinds of environmental reviews because they tend not to be as controversial as proposed federal actions that would impair the quality of the human environment. But NEPA would require some kind of environmental review um, if national monuments were designated by the Secretary of the Interior. It's because the office, the executive office of the president is not an agency and therefore not subject to the Administrative Procedure Act or to NEPA that there is a gap there. Um, I will say that there is more smoke than fire behind that law. Um, the, um, the modern practice for designating uh, monuments uh, does involve quite a bit of environmental review. And I, 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 uh, you know, I, I think that there may be something in the legislation which I haven't read which would require particular sorts of hearings that could um, thwart a president's efforts to m designate a monument promptly. Um, in terms of environmental studies, um, they are usually part and parcel of national monument designations, even under the current Antiquities Act. Thank you very much. You're welcome.